Let's start. So, good morning, everyone. Hi, nice meeting you. Thank you for very much for coming. Um, hi. So, my name is Ami, and uh, in the next 45 minutes, I'm going to talk about some Peel SQL. Uh, some of them are new features, some of them are not. <coughs> Give you some guidelines, my guidelines, my best practices for working better with Peel SQL, basically uh, achieving better performance using Peel SQL. A few words uh, about myself. I'm an Oracle Ace, an Oracle certified professional. I've been working with Oracle Database since about, uh, like, in the last 14, 14 to 15 years. Um, I'm doing lots of Oracle Database consulting and uh, training. Uh, about five years ago, I started my own company called DB Aces, and we are doing database training and consulting, uh, mostly um, training and consulting with companies that are uh, that are writing softwares based on the Oracle database as a platform. So we are working a lot with startup companies that uh, develop their startups based on the Oracle database as the database uh, platform. I'm also running the user group, the Israeli Oracle user group. I'm coming from Israel, and I'm the president of the Israeli Oracle user group, which is quite the same as any other user group, like the Latvian Oracle user group or any other user group, and we do a lot of collaboration, a lot of cooperation and sharing between uh, the user groups. We do similar events to the one you're attending right now. And um, I know uh, Andres for a few years now. And so um, I'm also running those kind of conferences and, and uh, uh, similar activities that you have here in, in Latvia also run the same in, uh, in Israel. A few words about the, the agenda. I only have 45 minutes, so I'll try to focus on the most important and the most interesting slides. Um, I'm quite sure that my slides, um, like if I, if I go over each one of the bullets and each one of the examples, it will probably take me like an hour, an hour and a half, and I only have 45 minutes. So I'll try to focus on the most important and most interesting uh, uh, issues and most interesting practices that I believe that are most uh, significant uh, to be aware of. Uh, anyway, you can get the slides, of course. I can share with you the slides. I'll give the slides to the, uh, to the team here. And you can also email, feel free to email me, and I can also send you the slides on the, on, the, on the email. I have my email address on the first slide and on the last slide, again, if you didn't copy it yet. And I'm also going to run a few examples uh, using SQL Plus. Uh, some of them take a little time, so I already, already executed them a few minutes ago, so we won't need to wait for the, for the procedures to run or for the inserts to run and so on. Anyway, I can share also all the examples, all the script files, okay? Those are all SQL files, simple SQL files, simple scripts. So later on, if you're interested in getting the scripts as well, you either email to me or just give me your email and I'll send it over. So I'm going to start with just two minutes about SQL Developer. Then we're going to go and see a few <coughs> bullets, a few slides about parsing, about using bulks, a peel SQL, new features in 11G like function result cache, sub-programming lining, if we have some time, maybe I'll talk a little about 12C new features, because there are a few very cool new features for developers in SQL and Peel SQL. And then a few last slides about uh, summarizing what we saw about Peel SQL uh, best practices and guidelines. Uh, my slides, my presentation is based on a training that uh, I've developed, uh, that we are running in my company. It's a training basically for developers doing uh, SQL and Peel SQL, new features, best practices for database developer and for application DBAs. And it's also based on other presentations that I delivered at Oracle Open World, and also on some slides taken from Tom Kite's examples, from examples that Tom Kite showed when he was in Israel, for example, and also uh, from his slides that he published on his website and other stuff. Let's start with a very short walkout. How many of you are using Toad? How many of you are using PLSQL Developer? Mm. <laughs> Interesting. How many of you are using SQL Developer, Oracle SQL Developer? Maybe you're too embarrassed to say that, okay. <laughs> so, just a few words. I, I don't want to promote Oracle SQL Developer because it's a free tool and I don't get any paid, so there's no reason to promote that. But I just want to say in, like in two minutes about SQL Developer. I think SQL Developer is something we all should be aware of, the fact that it's there, it's free, it's fully supported, uh, there's nothing to install. Basically, you just download a zip file, you open the zip file, double click it, and that's it. It's a Java application. It has JDBC Free Driver included in it. It comes for free anyway if you install 11G, although I don't recommend using 
the version that comes along with Oracle 11G when you install Oracle 11G because that's an older version and there's a much newer and much better version on the website. So you just need to log into oracle.com and download for free as I said. Um, you can develop, you can do DBA stuff, you can migrate from other database to Oracle. I just did a few migrations in the last year from SQL Server to Oracle with the Oracle Migration Workbench. That was the old solution provided by Oracle and now that Oracle Migration Workbench is embedded inside Oracle SQL Developer. Uh, so it's also very easy. You have some wizards and next, 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 step by step to make the, the migration. Uh, a lot of reports are embedded there, like uh, you want to see the logs, you want to see top queries, and so on and so on. Very similar to other tools such as Toad, such as PL SQL Developer, but this is something that is for free and fully supported by Oracle. Okay? The last version that was just released a few weeks ago is version number four. Uh, it's still an early adopter version, so it's not the final version, uh, but it looks nice. It looks uh, like it's quite clean from bugs. Of course, it has some bugs. Of course, it's an early adopter uh, version, but it looks okay. Um, and it also includes all the 12C new features. So if 12C, one of the main new features is using pluggable database and stuff like that. So all that new syntax using pluggable database or doing uh, data reduction in SQL Developer, everything is already in there. So you can download that and also use it later on if we try, if you start using Oracle uh, 12C. I'm just curious, how many of you are using Oracle database versions older than 10G? Don't be ashamed, it's okay. <laughs> you're, you're allowed to. Okay, so how many are using 10G? 11, 11G? Most of you, okay. 12C, anyone? There's one? A little bit. A little bit, great, great. Okay, so one last thing about SQL. I, because I always like to say a few words about SQL Developer, there's really a lot more thing to say about SQL Developer if you want to try it. So there are lots of tutorials that you can find there, Oracle by example in general. By the way, Oracle by example is something that if you're not familiar with that website, you should be. Oracle by example is a great website where you can find lots of tutorials on how you can do things in Oracle, how you can do in SQL Developer um, unit testing how uh, you can do migration with SQL Developer from one database to another, and so on and so on. So you can find many tutorials, demos, and lots of stuff, hands-on practices that you can actually find there in Oracle, by example. It's a very large le learning library, basically. Uh, so here I have some links on SQL Developer if you want to get uh, familiar, more familiar with the features and what exactly it has to offer for you. So you can just, as I said before, you can just take the slides and later on uh, try those links. One nice thing that I just found out, and that, that's the best thing basically that I like about SQL Developer, that I always learn new things, new stuff, new shortcuts that I wasn't aware of. One of the nice things that I just found out, like, I think it was like two months ago, if you want to get a select statement, like this is a very simple select style for employee statement, but you want a result in a CSV file. So you want to take the results and convert the results of the statement to CSV, just put commas. Uh, between the, the between the values, how can you do that? Put a, yeah, exactly. So that's what I just found out. When did you find out about it? I'm just curious. Like this is something very very old. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Phew, we read the same magazine. <laughs> so you just add. Uh, it looks like a hint, but it's basically oh, you can't really see it. Okay, now you can see it. It looks like it's a hint, but it's not a hint, more like just a comment. Slash star CSV star slash. No spaces and lowercase. When you do that and you click F5 to run it, then nothing happens. <laughs> okay. Then you get the results in a CSV file. Okay, it's not a file actually. You just need to save the results in a CSV file. So it's much easier to do it in SQL Developer. Instead of writing a select, if you're using SQL Plus, you'll need to concatenate the commas, the commas, and so on and so on. And if you want to get the result, for example, in an HTML file, so just change here the comment to HTML, and then the results are in an HTML format, TRTD, TRTD, and so on. Just a second. And one of the best things that I personally like is the fact that you can also write here insert, and then you get the results in an insert statement format. 
So we basically got a lot of insert statements. Each insert statement is inserting a new row into the table with the content. The content of the table was dumped into an insert format. Okay, so it's very easy to do that. Of course, you can do that also in Toad and Peel SQL Developer and other tools, but this is just a nice shortcut doing it very, very fast, very easy. You wanted to ask something? Uh, not us, but a uh, small note that you can basically do the same when you run that normal SQL statement with all these uh, comments. Uh, in, a, in this tool, you right uh, click, right, right oh. mouse click. Of course, of course. Of course, but this is much faster and shorter. Of course, you can do exactly the same without the comment, without that. Uh, Probably depends on the data volume. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there is a session, by the way, that starts right after my session at 12 o'clock <coughs> about SQL Developer and data modeling with SQL Developer, because part of SQL Developer is also the option, one of the options that you find there is also the one that you can actually design the database, build the ERD, the Entity Relationship Diagram, and convert it to actual SQL statements and do the vice versa, the reverse engineering and so on. So if you're interested more in SQL Developer and Data Modeler, go to the session pre presented by Haley at uh, 12 o'clock about uh, database design. Okay, this is a short example I want to talk about parsing time. I want to do it very fast just to show you the numbers, just so you, so you will be aware of what's going on when you're doing 100,000 insert statements in a loop without using a bind variable. So basically I'm creating 100,000 different insert statements, insert into T, values one, values two, values three, values four, and so on and so on, 100,000 different insert statements. As opposed to this example, these two slides are exactly the same, the only difference is the column here, be before the I, with the using I over there. So this basically means that you're going to do exactly the same thing, 100,000 insert statements, but you're basically running a single insert statement, 100,000 executions. So the first one was 100,000 parsing and 100,000 executions. So you had 100,000 different statements. And this one has only one statement in the shared pool, in the cache, that is passed only once, but executed 100,000 times. OK? Now, if we we'll take a look at the time, time difference, so the first one was almost 40 seconds, and the second one is, let's say, 10 seconds. So that's a nice difference, OK? Instead of doing it in 40 seconds, we can do it in 9 seconds or 10 seconds. But let's think about what happens if this is something that we run every night or once in a while. So it takes 40 seconds instead of 9 seconds, whatever. I, maybe, I don't even, maybe I'm not even aware of the fact that it actually takes longer, like a minute instead of a few seconds. Because anyway, it's just part of my batch that loads 100,000 rows or whatever. But that's not the most significant change if you do it with the bind or without the bind. The most significant difference, the change, is here. And this is basically what I'm doing here. I'll just show you the query. I'm basically selecting from v SQL area. I'll just take it higher. OK, that's the select statement. I'm selecting from v SQL area, showing you the two insert statements, how many different versions are in the cache, in the shell pool, in the place called SQL area. That's the area where the SQL statements are stored. And what's the total amount of memory, shareable memory? That's the column that I'm selecting from video SQL area. So what's the total size of the amount of memory that is allocated on our SJ, on our shared pool, for those 100,000 different insert statements? And look at the difference. So basically, if you look here for the memory, we have only 21,000 versions, almost 22,000 versions for the no bind. By the way, why do we have only 22,000 and not 100,000? I should have 100,000 versions. Why do I have only 22,000? Because I simply didn't have enough memory to allocate all the 100,000 versions of insert statements. So basically, the first one get, got into the memory, the second one got into the memory, the third one, the fourth one, and so on and so on. But after 22,000, I had to age out some of the insert statements because there's not enough memory on my laptop to to hold, to store all the 100,000 different versions. And the amount of memory that is allocated from my shared pool, the place where we store all the SQL statements, is about 300 megabytes. As opposed to the other one that took only 9 seconds or 10 seconds, that takes only 14 kilobytes. And this is much way more impressive than 40 seconds or 10 seconds. I don't mind that it takes 40 seconds. 40 seconds is good. But I do mind that I had to clear 300 megabytes of other stuff, other data, other SQL statements that had to be aged out of the cache in order to keep 
my 100,000 versions, and I didn't even keep the 100,000 version because I didn't have enough storage for that, enough memory for that, I could keep only 21,000. Okay, so using the bind variable is much way better from this end of point when we think about share pool and we think about how do we use the memory, how do we allocate memory on our instance. Okay, you wanted to ask something yeah, or just comment? Just a question. Do uh -huh. you have uh, automatic memory management of your SGA? I'm using, uh, yeah, I think so, yeah. Because That's what probably I recall. if uh, it was doing some kind of allocation of memory, probably, of course. another overhead, which is another completely over unnecessary. You are 100% you are correct, yeah, yeah, of course. Okay, so that was my example about uh, passing time and how much passing time can be very, very significant um, considering memory allocation, instance uh, tuning, okay? So, you can find the same examples on the slides, and once again, I can give you the SQL files uh, with the examples later on. Let's talk a few minutes about bulk. So, context switch, when we have a PL SQL procedure function package and we have a loop or we have a PL SQL that needs to run a SQL statement, then we have what is called the context switch. Basically, the engine needs to switch between PLSQL to SQL, okay? So if we have a loop, and inside the loop we do an insert or we do a select statement, so we have the context switch to switch between the loop, the PLSQL engine, and the SQL engine to, write, to run the insert, to run the select statement. And then we go back to the PLSQL engine, and so on and so on. Now, if we have a large loop that runs one million times, for example, and I'll show you an example in a minute, then we might have a lot of context switches. Okay, now this is not a new feature. This was introduced, if I remember correctly, 9i was the first version, maybe even 8i, I don't remember exactly, I think it was like 9i, that Oracle first introduced, let's do things in bulk and not row by row. Okay, so the basic thing about, the basic idea here about bulk binding or doing operations in bulk is to save those context switch, okay? So we can bind the whole array of values at once and just pass it to the other engine, to the PL SQL engine or the SQL engine, and then get the result at once. Just do it in bulk instead of going row by row, as Tom is saying, row by row, slow by slow, okay? So for select statement, we'll do bulk collect. So instead of selecting first row into array, second row into array, third row into array, and so on and so on, going back and forth, PL SQL SQL, We'll just bulk the select statement, collect into the array, and we'll do it in one single select statement. Just take all the data and bulk collect into my arrays. And as opposed to that, and I'll show you the example in a minute, if I have a one million rows in an array and I want to insert that array into a table, instead of going row by row, slow by slow, from my array and inserting the data into the table, I just take the all array and bulk it into the table. So instead of doing it in a for loop, I'll do it in a for all loop, okay? Which is a, it's not a loop, basically. I'll show you the example in a minute. So for select statement, we'll do bulk collect. For DML statement, we'll do for all. Uh, we can also use returning clause uh, to return uh, the information that was changed. So if we update something, we want to get the results of what we updated. So we can also use returning clause to return back to the calling environment, to the PL SQL environment, the results of my uh, DML change, uh, the results of the rows that were modified. It can also work with dynamic SQL, like I just showed you, uh, dynamic SQL with before with bind variables and everything, so we can also use that uh, for bulk. Um, this is also being improved in each and ver every version that Oracle uh, provides us, so it was first introduced in 9i and then some changes in 10g, and now we can also for example, save exceptions in your for all statements. So for example, if you have a loop um, on one million rows and with an array, you want to take that array and fill the table, but one of the rows or a few rows do not meet the constraints, for example. So you're trying to insert rows from that uh, array, that one million values array, and you're doing the bulk option, you're doing the bulk for all insert statement uh, in a loop. But then one of the rows is, uh, does not meet the constraint uh, rules, like it's not unique or something. You can save exceptions instead of failing the whole bulk operation, for example, okay? So there's, uh, there are also this, there's also the syntax for save exceptions. And there are many, many, basically the, the idea for me was 
to get you familiar with the fact that there is such a thing called bulk, and I'll show you one example, I'll show you the difference between doing it with bulk and without, but there's really, really a lot more to talk about bulks, okay? Um, we can have like a two hour session about only about bulk. So I strongly suggest if you're not familiar with bulk, go ahead, Google it, find the examples, or you can also email me if you like. I have more examples about bulk um, in addition to the one I'm going to show you now. So just in general, syntax will be select whatever bulk collect into, or fetch the cursor bulk collect into. Instead of going row by row from the cursor, you can just fetch the whole cursor at once. Uh, delete returning bulk collect into for all. This is the example I'm going to show you using for all instead of using a regular for loop and so on. Okay, so let me just show you um, very quickly the example with the bulk with the for all loop. So this is basically my example. It's a very simple anonymous block. Here I'm populating two arrays with one million rows. So I have one array that has numbers and another array that has names. So I'm just filling the array that eventually after this loop, that array will have one million rows, okay? And then what I'm trying to do is take that array, the two arrays actually, the array with the numbers and the array with the names, and insert those two arrays into a table. That's it. So the first one is a regular loop for i in dot first dot last from one to one million, insert into the table values and the two arrays. That's it, very simple one. And it takes 42 point something, almost 33 seconds to complete, okay? But when I do it with a for all, and this is the main part that is different, let me just put it higher. So when I do basically the same, and I insert into the table parts the one million rows from my two arrays, the array with the numbers and the array with the name, but in a for all statement that doesn't have the loop here and doesn't have the end loop here, then this is basically a bulk insert instead of a row by row insert, okay? So we take the all array or two arrays in this case, one context switch and we fill up the table with those two arrays, with those two, basically two columns, okay? And this one takes 2.5 seconds instead of 42 seconds. That's a, quite a big difference, okay? So that was about bulk. It's all about caching. 11G introduced, this is a, a new 11G feature what I'm gonna talk about now, okay? So 11G introduced basically uh, three new features related to caching. Um, SQL query result cache, peer SQL function result cache, which is the one I'm going to cover in a minute, and also, um, what, how do you call it? And I, oh, it's over there, thank you very much. <laughs> Client query result cache. I knew I want to remember it, so I put it on the slide. So there are basically three new features related to caching, and what's the meaning of those new features? What exactly is the, is the purpose here? We know that the database can cache blocks of data. So if we are querying from a table, we are querying a table employees, departments, whatever, the table is brought into the cache, the indexes are brought into the cache. We know we can cache the statements itself, the SQL statement, like we had before with the insert, we saw 21 versions, 21,000 versions of SQL statements. But what we don't <laughs> cache is the actual result of the statement. So for example, if I have a select statement that runs over a few tables and I need to join all those tables and do the group by and the having clause and the order by to sort and so on and so on, then if all, all data, all blocks, if everything is in the cache, still I have to do the query over and over again. Still I have to take the data that is in the cache, the blocks of data that are in the cache and do the join. Still I need to do the group by, still I have to do the work clause, still I have to sort the results and so on and so on. So we block, we, we put in the cache the blocks, we cache the, the data taken from the tables, taken from the indexes, but we don't cache the results of the statement, okay? And this is new in 11G. So 11G introduces SQL query result cache, which gives you exactly what I just explained. It gives you the ability to cache the results of a SQL statement. And we have the peer SQL function result cache, which basically gives you the ability to, re to cache the results of a peer SQL function. So if I have a function that is repeatedly executed over and over again, and basically gives you the same result, then you can just cache that result, and next time you call the function, there's no need to actually run the function, but just use the results from the cache. 
Okay, and this is what I'm going to demonstrate uh, in a minute. So this is an, an 11G new feature. Uh, by the way, the first one, the SQL query result cache, I'm not going to cover that because I, I want to focus more on PL SQL in this, in this presentation. I also have examples for that if you'll be interested later on. Um, but in general, you can say if you're using, how many of you are using or familiar with materialized views? You know the concept of material? Oh, that's nice. So materialized view is basically quite the same, but materialized view is an actual segment. It's an actual table that stores the result of a select statement. So the first one, the SQL query result cache, is basically more like kind of an in-memory materialized view, only in memory, because there's no segment involved here. You don't need to create a table. You just run a query, and you tell the Oracle by using an optimizer hint, by the way, like you use index hint or full table scan hint or use nested loop join hint or whatever. So there's a new hint, basically, result cache. So by writing a select statement and using that new hint result cache, you're basically telling Oracle, I want to cache the results of this statement, quite similar to a materialized view, but in the memory only, in the cache only. Okay? So let's see the example with the pure SQL function result cache. So let's say I have a function, and each time I will execute the function, it will always take one second to complete. Okay? So basically, if I run the function once, it takes a second. Then another time, the second time, it takes another second. Third time, it takes another second. 1,000 executions will take 1,000 seconds. By using PL SQL function result cache, I can run 1,000 executions in a single second. Because the first time that I run the function, it will take a second. And all the next executions, 99, 90, uh, 999 executions, will take zero. Because the function was already executed, and we already know the result of the function. That's basically the idea behind PL SQL function result cache. So it gives you the ability to store the result of the function in the cache. By the way, the, the memory structure, the cache that is used for either PL SQL function result cache or the previous one, the SQL result cache, it's the same memory structure, and it's allocated in the shared pool. Which means that even if the data, let's say I have a function or a SQL query result cache that is based on tables, employees, departments, customers, orders, whatever, and the data is not in the cache, the tables were aged out of the cache, I still have the results in another cache, which is, which is the shared pool. That's the same cache where we have the SQL statement with the parsing process, the execution plan, and everything that we uh, talked about um, a little uh, earlier when I talked about parsing <coughs> process, okay? So the result of the pure SQL function will be cached in that shared pool area in a new designated area. Uh, default size, I think it's something like 5%, if I remember correctly. It's 5% from the total shared pool uh, memory structure. Um, it's very easy to use it, very highly efficient. So let, let me just show you a, a quick example. You have the basic syntax, the basic example here on the slide, and also the example that I have prepared in advance. So let's just run this one. PL SQL function, function, function. Chen, result cache, and let me just explain it very briefly. So what I have here is a function, let's start with the first one called not cached, okay? So this function doesn't use the new caching feature, okay? It's just a regular function. It gets a name, which is an owner, basically, owner of the, of this, uh, of the tables, of the indexes, owner of segment, the schema name, basically. And it simply counts, count star into count variable, how many objects belongs to that owner. OK, I'm using a table called T1. T1 is basically just a duplication of DBA objects, or DBA tables. Or I think I'm using DBA objects, so all objects, not only tables. So basically, if I get a schema name such as HR, human resource schema, I'm basically counting how many objects belong to that human resource schema. And I return the results. Now, I added here dbmslog.slip dot slip and then in parentheses one, which basically means that this function is going to slip one second. Okay? So regardless of how long it's gonna take to actually select the data, maybe this select statement, select count star, will return in 0 0.005 seconds. Still, the function will run at least one second because it has to slip, it has to wait a second. Okay? So of course, each time I run this statement, it's going to take at least one second because of the slipping. Now, let's see the second version. The second version with the cached is basically exactly the same as the first one. The second version has the same select count star into count, 
Well, owner equals P owner, that's the name I'm getting into the function. It has the same slip, one second. Only difference is this one, result cache. This is basically telling Oracle, listen, when you call this function with the, with the owner, with the parameter value of HR, first time, I'll cache the results, result cache, so I know how many objects belong to HR. Second time, when you run the same function, I don't need to run the function. I can just use the results that I cached, how many objects belong to HR. So let's see what happens when I run the not cached and the cached function, okay? So you can see here, it's still running, okay, that's it. You can see here that when I run the um, not cached option, so I got 201 objects. 201 objects belongs to the owner, age, RS, age, whatever. Okay, whatever the, the parameter value that I, that I used. So it took one second, first time, 201, one second again, next time, 201, one second again, third time. It will always take one second for the not cached function version because it always has to sleep one second. Okay, but then I'm running the cached version. And when I run the cached version, the one that actually needs to be cached, the results should be cached. So the first one takes 200, gives us 201 results, 201 objects, and it takes a second because it's the first execution of the function. But then the second time I execute the same function, it actually takes zero, and the third one actually takes zero as well, which tells you that Oracle didn't run the function. Because if, was Oracle, was, if Oracle was running the function, it, was, it should take a second because it has the sleep, right? So if I see the function declaration and I see that it says result cache, I know that for HR, <coughs> excuse me, for that parameter value, I don't need to run the function again. If I had to run the function, if I had to go to the begin where the function actually starts here and do what's written inside the, between the begin and end of the function, I had to sleep for a second. And if that function was executed and completed successfully in zero time, it basically means that I didn't even start running the function. I just saw result cache. I saw that it's the same parameter, HR, and I already know the result. It's 201. So go ahead. Let's give the user the result 201. So now I'm just, just as an example, I'm flushing the result cache. Uh, you can see the command here. I'm using a new package called DBMS result cache. By using DBMS result cache, you can handle you can handle the new memory structure, the new caching uh, structure in the shared pool, as I remember, as I mentioned earlier. So I can flush it, invalidate objects, and so on. So because I flash the cache, the first execution after flashing the cache takes one second again because Oracle has to rerun the function. Okay, there's nothing in the cache. I flush the cache. Then the second iteration gives you the same results in zero time again, because the, the result is already cached. And then if I run the same function, the cached one, but with a different value, so I'm not calling the function with SH to give me the number of objects belongs to SH, but another value, like sys, for example. So it's a different answer, it's a different result, it's 9,200 something. So it takes a second, of course, to complete, because I had to run the function, but then zero, zero, and so on, okay? One last thing about pure SQL function result cache. As I wrote it now, just writing here, just saying here, result cache, that's it. The function is not dependent on the actual table, T1, which means that if the table is modified, if the table is changed, if I add more object basically to that same owner SH, I will still get the same results. It's not going to be updated automatically because this is how I said this is how I declare the function result cache. If I want it to be dependent on the actual base table, in this case T1, I have to add here result cache relies on T1. And then if T1 is modified, if T1 is changed, automatically Oracle knows that it needs to invalidate the cache and rerun the statement, rerun the function to get the new updated number of objects belonging to that schema. Okay? What's the statement again? Relies on. Result cache relies on and the name of the object, the list of the objects. Okay? Good. Sub program in line. <coughs> What's the time? Okay, not bad. So, sub program in line. Uh, this is another new feature introduced in 11G, and it's quite interesting. 
basically what Oracle is saying here is that each time in your procedure, in your function package, you call another procedure, another function, that slightly but still measurable performance overhead occurs each time we use that other function and use that other procedure. So basically, if we have a, like a loop, let, let me just show you the example, it will be faster. If I have like a loop here, this is just a basic anonymous block, and I have a loop, and inside the loop I'm calling here a function, add numbers, add number is a function, okay? So this is a very simple anonymous block. It simply takes a number, or actually two numbers, and it calls the function add numbers, and it gets the result number one plus number two. That's it, it's very simple. So I'm taking five and six, calling the function, and the function returns me 11. I take seven and eight, call the function, functions return me 15, and so on and so on. It's very simple. But what Oracle is saying that, because I'm calling the function here, add numbers, and I'm not actually writing the actual code here, the actual code that is included in the function, this function call here has a very slight, very minor, very small amount of overhead of time that I need in order to actually call that other object and embed the code of that other object inside your loop, but still, it's something measurable. So maybe it's a very slight and small overhead, but it's still something that we can actually we can actually measure that. We can actually see the benefit of, instead of writing here a function, writing here the actual code. So basically, if we do a test and we call the function add numbers, or instead we just write the actual code of add numbers, the second option of actually writing the actual code instead of calling the function will actually work faster. This is what Oracle is saying. But, of course, that's not the right way to do it, to actually write or embed here the actual function. We want to use a function. We want to use another procedure. That's the whole thing about using procedures and functions. We want to call one program from another program. We, want to, we don't want to actually embed the content of that procedure, the content of that other sub-program inside of my uh, anonymous block. So what can I do to make this one actually behave like the code was embedded inside the, inside the, inside the, um, the loop? So the second one, the second example, so that's the first one, the, the first example, where I'm calling the function add numbers. And the second one looks exactly the same, but with this additional line. Front line, in line, add numbers, yes. And what's the difference between the first one and the second one? And I'll, and I'll run it and I'll show you the difference when we set a point of performance, the time difference, in a minute. So the second one, front line, in line, add numbers, this basically is telling Oracle, listen, when you compile the code, you compile the code with the actual content of the add numbers function, and not as it looks like when I, when I wrote it. So I wrote it while I was just calling the function add numbers. But when you compile it and when you store it in your engine, the Peel SQL engine, in your Peel SQL code, you will actually store it with the content of the function, with the actual text of the function. So when I call it numbers, I don't really need to call it because it's already there inside the code. Okay? So let's see the difference. Just to summarize what we just said, every code that procedure function causes a slight but still measurable performance over it. Uh, it's especially noticeable when it's inside a loop, like in our case, I have a loop with one million iterations, I think. Yes, my loop is going to run one million times, so it's going to have a, quite a significant uh, difference, okay? Uh, automatic subprogramming line can reduce that overhead, and I'll show you when we can have that, that feature I just represented with the pragma inline, when I can have that one also automatically. Uh, it, it depends on an Oracle uh, database parameter, I'll show you in a minute. And this is basically, uh, this is something we can achieve by just changing, um, switching between the sub-program call with the actual copy of code. And this is what I just did with using that pragma inline. So let's run it, sub-program inlining, sub-program inlining, okay? So that's the database parameter called PLSQL Optimize Level. PLSQL Optimize Level is the parameter that basically affects the optimizer uh, and gives the optimizer different ways to optimize pure SQL procedure, pure SQL function, pure SQL code, okay? Now the default value of pure SQL optimize uh, level, the default value is two. 
Now, I'm not saying that you should change it to free, what I'm going to demonstrate in a minute. I'm going to change it to now to free, to, to increase the value, which basically means that I'm going to increase the level of peer cycle optimization. <laughs> Okay, I'm not saying that this is something I recommend, or this is something that you should do tomorrow morning in your databases. Or well, not tomorrow, it's Saturday, but Monday morning, whatever. Okay, I'm just saying that if we change it, then the optimizer will have wider options, more features to use to optimize your pure SQL statements. So this is something that you should check. This is something that you should test and see what's the output of that, what's the performance benefit that you gain from changing that parameter. Okay, and I'll show you the example what I get from using that parameter. So, um, on, the first, on the first time when I run it, while the parameter value is 2, it takes about 2.2, 2.3 seconds to complete my loop, okay? It's a very simple loop. I'm just taking two numbers and get, adding the two numbers, summing the two numbers and getting a result, how much is number 1 plus number 2, that's it. So it takes 2 point something seconds, 2.3 seconds. Then I do it with inline equals yes. Okay, with that string, that, with that statement I showed you, pragma inline, add numbers, the name of the function, and yes. And then it takes basically half the time. It takes only 1.2 seconds, about half, 50% reduction in time, about 50% do the same work, basically. Okay, but I don't need to call the function because the actual code is compiled inside that, inside that loop. Now, another option is to change the parameter value to number three, and this is what I did here. I did other session and change pure SQL optimize level to free. So then when I'm running my function here inside of the loop, I'm not doing that pragma inline again. There's no need to write pragma inline and numbers because it's going to be automatically by the optimizer, by the pure SQL engine, op by pure SQL optimizer engine. So you can see that when I switch to number three, and now the value of parameter pure SQL optimizer is set to free, run the anonymous block without inline, and I got the same results, 1.2 seconds, half the time. I don't need to add that pragma inline, okay? And just to prove that, when I add the pragma inline, but I said no, don't do an inline. I can also add no here. It's either yes or no. So in this case, it's pragma inline, add numbers, but no, I don't want you to do that. I know you're going to do it automatically because of the parameter, but I don't want you to do that. So we got back to the original value of two point something seconds without the pragma inline, okay? So that's about um, sub-program inlining. It's another 11G new feature. This is another, another thing that is very interesting that was introduced in 11G. And this is not something that we need to uh, do something in, about it. We don't need to do anything about it. We don't need to change the feature, but database parameter, whatever. This is simply the way Oracle works. This is how it works since 11G and beyond. And this is not necessarily related to pure SQL, by the way. Let's take a very uh, simple example. You had a table with 10 columns. And now you had a view that selects column A, B, C, only three columns. Now you took your table with the 10 columns and you added another column, 11. What happened to your view? What happened to your view? The view is invalid. Why is the view marked as invalid? Because the view relies on a table and the table structure was changed. Although, basically, nothing should happen to the view because the view relies on A, B, C, and you just added another, another column, column number 11, which you're not using and you're not querying your view. But still, before 11G, you can check that and you'll see that a view that depends on a table, if the table is modified, and I don't mean modify, insert, update, delete, I mean, DDL change, changing the structure of the table, even if the view is not using those columns, the view becomes invalid. It doesn't mean that you need to do anything about it, because next time you'll query from the view, automatically the view gets compiled, recompiled, and it will become valid. So basically you don't need to be afraid of that or be aware of that, because it will automatically happen. But <coughs> there's an overhead in doing that. Each time a view is invalid, or each time a pure SQL procedure was invalid because something else was changed, something else was modified, and because of the dependency, that view, that object became invalid, Oracle had to recompile that view, recompile that procedure, recompile that package to, be, to make it valid, to, to, make, to make it valid so you can use it, so and eventually it will become valid. 11G final grade dependencies is a new feature basically saying that we are keeping track <coughs> excuse me, on uh, object dependency 
in a much better way, in a more granular way, which basically means that if I have a view on ABC and the table has 10 columns, but you added the 11 column, so what? View stays valid, okay? So we no longer have that invalidation like we had before. Uh, so dependent objects were sometimes invalidated before, but they will not get invalidated um, from now on from 11G. So by reducing, this is basically a performance feature, because by reducing those invalidations of those objects that are not really dependent on the change that we implement in the table, like you add an 11th column, and the view always se only selects on three columns, then I don't care that we add an 11th column. I don't need to mark that view as invalid. Even if the view is not marked as invalid, there's no need to recompile the view. If we don't recompile the view, we basically saved time and we saved CPU, okay? So this is basically, uh, this can give you a lot of benefit from the standpoint of performance, and there's nothing you should do about it, okay? This is how it works from 11G and beyond. So there's an example for that, a SQL file called Final Grain Dependencies. When you go over the uh, presentation later on, and you'll see on the slides on the right bottom uh, part of the slide, you'll see a name of the file.sql. It means that there is an example. I'm going to skip the example now. I'll explain the, in general the, the, that new behavior, that new feature, and later on you can run that example also. I base my examples on either uh, objects that I create and drop and everything. It's a self-contained example. All the examples are based on the Oracle example schemas that comes along with the database. There are two example schemas that I'm using in my examples. It's either HR, human resource, or SH, sales history. Those are the two example schemas that I sometimes use. Can I have a question? Yes. Is this available also in a standard edition? Or yes, yes, yes. It's available in all editions, yes. It's, it's a change in the engine. It's not, a, it's not a feature that you need to turn on or do whatever. This is how it works. Does it work for types? Uh, Yes. Package, packages, procedures, yes, the same. So it Actually, the columns, which I mentioned in, in package. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Actually, the, the example that I had, I, I skipped the example. The example that I have, it has two parts. One is with a table and a view, and the other one is with a package. So you can see in that example, I have a package and a procedure, and I change the package, and the procedure doesn't become invalid because the, the part of the package that I change doesn't make any difference for the procedure that relies on that package. So you can see it also later on <laughs> if you run the, the example. Just a few last words about 12C new features, and then we'll summarize uh, what I just said. One of the nice features in 12C is called invisible columns. We can add a column or change an existing column to be invisible. Invisible basically means that the application that is querying from the database, that is querying from that table, will not be possible to see that column unless you explicitly query that column. So if you have an insert statement and your application is not aware of that new column because you, when you wrote the code, that column doesn't exist and now you added that column, but you added it as invisible, application basically will not get any errors because the application will try to insert to other columns and that new column is invisible. You cannot see it, okay? You can only see it and query it or insert it if you explicitly use that column. Uh, what if it is what the file is mandatory? Let's talk about it later on because I have to finish. I'm sorry, really. But I also, by the way, I also have an example for invisible column on the slides. So you either just look at the example later on or you can find me outside after I finish and we can talk it. I also have 12C um, installed on my laptop, so we can also have an example if you want, but later on today. You can grant roles to peer SQL code, which is also something new in 12C, and that's very cool because I don't know if you're familiar with the fact that when you run a peer SQL procedure, you cannot use and you cannot inherit the, um, um, the privilege that you got for a role, only the privilege that you got granted directly. So now there's a new option in 12C to grant roles to the code, to the peer SQL code, which is a very cool option. You can run peer SQL from SQL statement. So this is also something very nice. You can actually have a with clause. How many of you are using with, with clauses in SQL statements? So in your with clause, you can have a procedure or a function. And then in your select, you can just call that function, call that procedure. There's no need to actually create a procedure or create a function. You can just embed that peer SQL function or procedure inside your with clause. I have also an example for that. That's very nice. Improve defaults. You have new defaults. You have identity, similar to what we have in SQL Server and in other databases, when you can have a sequence column automatically generated, automatic numbers generated uh, by the database. 
equal to a sequence and so on, and some new enhanced statistics. Okay. So there's an example for invisible karma on my, uh, on my presentation, but I have to skip it. And uh, we're going to finish now because it's already five, six minutes beyond my time. Just to summarize what I said, there are also two more slides just to summarize the best practices, the, the things that I showed in my presentation about bulk and, and about uh, uh, using caching and so on. Uh, and as I said at the beginning, you can get the slides. Uh, I'm going to leave the slides here for the team that organizes the, the conference, and you can also have my email. You can just copy my email. It's a little low there, so I'll, let me just write it here. So that's my email. Selected from dual. <laughs> anyway, so um, if you have any questions or anything, I'm still here, so you can just feel free to come over and ask. You can also have my business card with my email on it, so whatever. And I can also send you, as I said before, the scripts, if you're interested in the script itself, so I can just email to you later on. Thank you very much for coming. I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you.